Shalom Aleichem. Good afternoon, everyone. I read a very upsetting article today, and I want to come out to condemn uh, the very, very horrible um, and disrespectful actions of a few hooligans from the settler movement, so-called Jewish, nothing Jewish about them, even they might have long payas like we have, beards and payas, they might wear yarmulkes, but there's nothing Jewish about this movement, it's really, really the opposite of authentic Judaism. Uh, you know, I'll, be, I'll even be honest, uh, you know, they don't even really represent the teachings that their own movement, the religious Zionist movement, which I have many problems with, and yet even the teachings of their Rabbi Cook and so forth, I think would also condemn these types of actions. I'm talking about something that took place uh, this past weekend. Yeah, the Greek Orthodox Church observed Pentecost this past weekend. And it's interesting, this year there were many different opinions among Christian churches in Lahavdil by us, by the Jews of when the holiday of Pentecost would be observed. The uh, Western churches were mostly observing Pentecost a month before our holiday of Shavuos, which is Pentecost, same holiday really, um, because the Jewish calendar, we had a leap year, and so there was a discrepancy in the calendar. I'm sure uh, many of the uh, Karaite type groups, heretical groups like that, uh, probably also observed around that time. Um, and then we, rabbinical Jews, celebrated the festival of Shavuos uh, about a week and a half ago, uh, the Feast of Weeks, which in Greek they call Pentecost. And the Orthodox churches, because their Easter always falls after our Passover, they actually celebrated Pentecost a week later than our Pentecost. And that's about it. That's said. That, so during the Feast of Pentecost, the um, members of the, particularly clergy and other members of the Greek Orthodox Church, uh, ascended to Mount Zion, which is right outside the walls of the old city of Jerusalem, to the place of the Last Supper, according to their tradition, and also, um, I guess, where the... Uh, Pentecost also took place according to their tradition. In our tradition, we say that that's the tomb of King David, and nearby would be buried King Solomon, King Hezekiah, all in that same area. These are the tombs of the kings. Um, there's a yeshiva in the area, and there's also churches, and they've generally shared the space peacefully for the past few decades, um, since the past 40 years or so. 39 years, 40 years, coming up 40 years next year. Um, I'm sorry, uh, this, yeah, from, from, yeah, well, almost 50 years, yeah, right, 67 till uh, whatever, almost 50 years, 49 years, so. And now, um, this, um, now, this was arranged with the local rabbis there, and that, that it should be done in a way that both faiths could share this space that they both understand to be sacred in their traditions, and it was done in a very respectful way on both sides, both by the local rabbis there and by the Greek Orthodox clergy. Now, who should come along but a few hooligans from the settler movement who, unfortunately, like I said, bear hairstyles similar to ours, long beards and hairs and so forth, but, uh, and even some folks there were dressed in, in our traditional Eastern European styles that the Hasidim wear. Um, and this was a tremendous chil Hashem, a tremendous disrespect, for the following reason. Now, of course, we know the Torah prohibits idolatry, particularly in the Holy Land and so forth. But, that's an ideal situation. 
we are living in a, in an exiled state. We do not have any rights as Jews to impose our will on people of other faiths. That's totally against our religion because God sent us into exile because we weren't doing our job well enough. So we're going to start bossing other people around. We're not even doing what we're supposed to do right. we got to clean our house first before we can start uh, imposing on others. Now we could politely share with others. Even that has been very difficult over the years. Now in recent years, we're living in a more free society where we can share our faith. But to impose is absolutely out of the question. We do not have that power. And we will never need to wield that power. Although in ancient times, during the times of the first temple, uh, and before the first temple, the times of the judges, that was expected and generally failed, uh, but it was expected. Really, ever since the Roman occupation, um, that has been taken out of our hands, and really even throughout the second temple period, there really was n never much of a movement, except for the case of the Idumeans, as one isolated incident, there was never a case where we imposed our religious ideals on others, because we're in exile, and we're under the rule of others, and we have to be practical. We have Life is the most precious commodity we have, and we can't put things in danger, and we can't be fighting with people, because peace and life are the first and foremost um, ideals of Judaism. Now, uh, I say we will never have to wield that again. Why? Because we're waiting not for just to get up and go to the land and have a flag and, and a piece of land and, and be nationalists. That's not the, what we've been waiting for for thousands of years. That hasn't been our hope for thousands of years, as, as some people would like to claim in certain anthems that they sing and so forth. Rather, our hope and our prayer is for the true Messiah to come. And during that period, there will not be any need to wage wars, because the knowledge of God will cover the world like the ocean, like the waters cover the seas. That's what Isaiah tells us, Micah tells us the same thing. That's what the Bible promises us, that we're looking forward to a time of universal peace and understanding. And so, you know, if we're right, as we claim about our faith, God will bring that to the whole world, and we don't need to take up arms and so forth to spread our faith, and we certainly don't need to be rude and nasty to people of other faiths, particularly ones that have very little to do with, you know, I mean, here in this particular case, you know, these settler hooligans were saying, oh, you know, you, you people persecuted us, and we got to chase you out of our holy place, and so forth. I don't I'm not really familiar with the Greek Orthodox Church really persecuting Jews. I, I, I know I, in the history of the Greek Orthodox Church, or other churches that in the past may have, have since repented of those sins and, and sought reconciliation. But the Greek Orthodox Church, I, the, the Jews in Greece in general, uh, were not persecuted uh, in Salonika and places like this. I'm not, I'm not going to understand even, you know, these these hooligans don't even know basic history. Um, so it's really, really um, quite offensive, and and these people deserve to be, um, to, they deserve to, really, they should be arrested for their disrespect, um, and, and they should, and all Ehrlich Eden, all pious Jews, should be moiche, should rebuke these these hooligans who don't really care about uh, peace, don't care about the basic ideals of Judaism, and even like I said, they claim to be from the religious Zionist camp. Their Rabbi Cook taught a sense of reconciliation and peace and so forth with other with other religions. So I don't understand where they're even coming from. What is their basis? 
to act in such a, a, a rude and disrespectful manner to people of other faiths. Um, when, particularly when these people are going out of their way to try to be respectful to us. And, and uh, but also want to practice their religion. Now again, we can hope and pray for a time of peace when idolatry will be eradicated. And even uh, we can argue whether or not this is idolatry, whether we follow Maimonides who says it was, or we follow the Meiri who says perhaps for a Jew it could be idolatry, but for people of, who uh, are Gentiles it might even be permitted. And for sure in these days when we're in exile we have no right to impose our ways on anybody else. Um, you know, we, we, we have enough of a hard time with ourselves, you know. So, uh, there cannot be enough words said to, um, to rebuke and, and, and to uh, utterly dismiss and, and, and speak out against these hooligans who are trying to stir up fights with people who we have no fight with. It's stupid, it's foolish, it's a chil Hashem, it's a desecration of God's name. I understand they're thinking they're fighting against idolatry and so forth. I had one of my students actually, uh, he asked me, you know, he said, he's learning in the yeshiva over there, and he asked me, what should he do? You know, should he join in this protest against... I said, absolutely not. Absolutely not. And, and you should discourage anybody who wants to protest against these, this is, there's really absolutely no reason to, um, particularly I heard, you know, they went out of their way, uh, these, uh, these Greek Orthodox clergy to be utterly respectful, it was, it was, I was, they, they really went above and beyond, and they should be welcomed, especially when they, uh, agreed not to have certain idolatrous practices and symbols and, and iconic, iconic, uh, uh, you know, icons and so forth. They agreed to keep it totally in a respectful way that both, that, that, that's totally respectful to the Jewish faith, but they wanted to celebrate their holiday in this holy place that's holy to both Jews and Christians. And I don't see any reason for them to be denied from doing so. It's really quite dismaying and shocking, and it's totally not based in Judaism to uh, to engage in this type of uh, in this type of uh, attitude. So um, and so I, I, I'm publicly condemning uh, these hooligans. And I hope other Jewish people also will come out publicly con to condemn this type of hooliganism that has no place in civil society. Um, and uh, and it also, incidentally, it shows this is really, I, I, you know, and I don't want this, I didn't intend this to be an anti-Zionist rant, but rather to be, because even, I would say, most Zionists would disagree with this type of uh, action. The only thing I can say, though, is that this is this type of activity and this type of attitudes are really the fruits of what Zionism has borne. Because, it's particularly, you know, if you take religious Zionism to its logical conclusion, this is what it bears out, and it's totally not Jewish. And mo again, like I said, most people who consider themselves Zionists and support the state of Israel and so forth, whether religious and certainly the secular, the secular I'm sure are totally embarrassed by something like this, but the religious should be even more embarrassed because this is totally an embarrassment to Judaism. And really, and if you're a religious Zionist, it should be a, a, a or, or any type of Zionist, which I'm not necessarily, or I just, uh, I'm, 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 it's not really for me to say, it's, you know, I'm not one to take sides in, in these type of issues, but I think it's the, uh, it's the, the job of, of uh, every pious religious Zionist who really wants to live peacefully and so forth, and uh, in the way that their own teacher, Rabbi Cook, taught, um, should 
come out and condemn these type of actions and seek reconciliation. You know, I'm here in New York. I don't have any place to go to, um, you know, and really I don't even know any Greek Orthodox churches in my area. And it's really, it's really not a religious issue. It's a local issue in Jerusalem. But I really feel that the people in Jerusalem uh, and even among the settlers, there were individuals who sought out peace. I particularly remember Rabbi Froman, Zechren Levracha, who I remember personally. I remember praying with him on a Shana Rabba, uh, twi- two years. I remember praying with a very special man who loved people of all different faiths and really sought out to live in a peaceful way and really lived up to uh, a cookie and legacy in a true way and uh, and that's the that's the path that uh, I wish more of the settler movement would embrace that if they all right they have some religious devotion to a piece of land which could also be considered idolatrous by some you know where Shia Lebovich who was uh, a great professor uh, a religious Zionist uh, modern Orthodox religious Zionist condemned this type of land worship, wall worship, and so forth, as idolatrous. So, um, you know, I wish there would be more common sense in that in those camps, and, and then we could see more reconciliation. It's, it's a shame even within the Haredi camps also, especially in Jerusalem, you do have certain hooliganism, which is not supported by any rabbis. None of the, none of the rabbis support any of this hooliganism. Um, and they all condemn it. Um, and we should try to seek out pathways of peace, brotherhood, um, even if we don't agree, you know, just living and with tolerance and so forth doesn't mean that you necessarily agree or support the others, but we can still sit together and have a certain level of fellowship, particularly that we have so much in common. Let's try to find fellowship in those things that we have in common and not not fall into the hands of hooliganism and extremism and so forth. Uh, let's adapt a more libertarian, live and let live type of situation. And I, of course, know that that comes from the other traditions, but still, it's a good idea, you know. If you believe, if if you hear that there's wisdom among the nations, you should believe the Talmud says, and that's a, that's certainly a level of wisdom, even uh, to live and let live, have a basic libertarian idea, because things are not going to be perfect. We're not going to change the world. We're not going to make you know. You know, and I've, t- I've spoken to about. I remember, I myself, you know, I. I remember I was speaking to one Admor, one Hasidish Rebbe from Jerusalem um, about, you know, why, why, you know, certain things, political ideas I have. And he said to me, Yitzchak, you're not going to change the world. What's the point of even talking about it? And the sad thing is that many of these hooligans, they think they're going to change the world. They think they're going to do it. And they wind up in such an extreme... Uh, and, and uh, dangerous attitude. You know, I heard, a, a, you know, an acquaintance of mine, someone I met once and we've been in contact since then, uh, Rabbi Ariel Bart Sadok, he lives in, in Tennessee, he's sometimes on television, he has a, a website he writes, now he's been writing a lot more poetry and things, and I listened to, he was discussing on the Heir, with the Israelis celebrate their Independence Day, and he was talking about how he he said he hopes the temple is never built. He's like, when the, if the Messiah comes, when the Messiah comes, that's a different story. God's going to send it down from heaven. It'll be peaceful. But if a bunch of hooligans are going to get together and fight against the Muslims and build the temple, that that's not Judaism. And this is a religious Zionist speaking. This is not an Atari Karta. This is not a Satmar. This is a religious Zionist saying... Forget about building the temple. Forget about all these temple Mount Faithful and all these things. These things put Jews in danger. And he's 100% right. You know. Uh, certain other things may, that he said I might have disagreed with. But this point that he has, 
you know, it's, uh, he's 100% right, we should, we should seek a rationalist approach, and this is a man who's a big capitalist, a big mystic, and he said that the real, ultimate mysticism is rationalism, it's very interesting, and he brings from the teachings that are resolved from Chaim Vital, that really, that the power of rational thought is on par with prophecy in many ways, and he said, you know, that we see in history the development of rational thought um, in the formation of the United States, particularly um, when I thought when the secular enlightenment, I don't mean the Jewish enlightenment, which was going away from Torah, but the uh, secular enlightenment really, even though it, it challenged the religious norms in many ways, it really embraced, for the most part, biblical, sound biblical ideas and, and ideals. And that's really the approach that we should be seeking out. And yes, we'd be religious in our own lives and so forth, and do mitzvos and so forth. And all those things are very important to put on tefillin every day to keep kosher and Shabbos. And all of these things which help us to really become, these are, you know, these are, are of course, they are ends within themselves, but they're also means, that they, incidentally, they have a fringe benefit of being means to ends of great, of, you know, things that are more universal. Um, so, again, I, I call on anybody who agrees with me to condemn the, these hooligans who have come to protest again, and, and in a very rude and nasty way, protest against the, the Greek Orthodox Christians who are visiting King David's tomb on Pentecost. And it's very nice how the, these pilgrims, even though there has been history of violence of, even among their own groups, uh, even between the various priests and so forth, there has been, there have been violent uh, outbreaks every now and then over issues like this. However, it's quite nice to hear that they did not, they did not engage, they, did, they actually were, remained politely and uh, in, with the, and didn't react in any violent way against these protesters who are claiming to be Jewish and probably more like Averfrab, even with their beards and payas. And uh, and so I, I congratulate them for that, and, and I ask everyone to condemn these actions if, if you agree with me. And if you disagree with me, I would love to hear in the comments um, any justification that you could think of uh, for acting in such a way in, in Gaulus these days. And uh, and the only answers you're going to hear are, well, uh, it's a Jewish state, this and that. That's, that's nonsense. That's really nonsense, because we don't need to make more enemies. Uh, you know, they have enough enemies there, and they've made enemies of a, uh, for, um, against Jews by their actions just by virtue of existing without being too antagonistic to begin with. And then they're going to go and antagonize people who are friendly to us? Are you out of your mind? Does, any, uh, does anybody think that that's the right thing? I, 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 can't, I don't understand how, uh, what the logic is behind that type of approach. So if, you know, and I understand I'm gonna, if I get comments, they're gonna be, oh, you know, uh, you know, they're gonna be the same militant extremist type of quote, but that's not Judaism, I'm sorry, that's not, that's not Torah, that's not, God put us in exile specifically to cure us of that type of nonsense, you know, and, and I, and I, and I don't, I have no qualms about calling it nonsense, you know, there's a difference when biblical accounts of war, that's talking about they had the Urim Metumim, they had the, the breastplate of the high priest that answered their questions, they were in direct communication with God, they were commanded directly, 
that's a different story. You can't compare to Tate to then, even the Second Temple times. To the, a lot of people make a mistake. They think that the Maccabees were fighting the Greeks. The Maccabees were not fighting any Greeks, or Syrian Greeks for that matter. They were fighting Hellenized Jews. People who were Jewish, who were not only abandoning our faith, but fighting against our faith and preventing us from observing our faith. That's a whole different story. But uh, to fight against Gentiles, we didn't have it all in the Second Temple period. And even those who did uh, in the times of the Romans and so forth were utterly condemned by by the authentic rabbis. The, the zealot movement was totally against the rabbis. The rabbis condemned Masada. They condemned the zealots. They called them baryonim. They called them uh, barbarians. That's what they were. They, they, and they destroyed. They destroyed the peace. These type of people. If you look in the history of what happened, the destruction of the temple. You know they had enough. The rich people in Jerusalem. They stored up enough grain, enough food. They could have sat and lasted uh, with just by matter of attrition, and they could have just sat out the Romans, and not, and they would not have been exiled. But what happened, the Baryonim went and destroyed all their food because they wanted to incite a war, because they, they wanted independence, they cared more about independence than they cared about life, and that's not a Jewish idea. And so what did Rebbe Yochanan ben Zakkai, a real Jewish hero, do? He didn't go and fight the Romans, he didn't go and be violent. What did he do? He went humbly before the uh, uh, Vespasian, who wasn't the emperor yet, and told him prophetically that he would become emperor. He was still a general then, and he told, and he asked me, he asked, he asked uh, Vespasian, he asked him, "Tainly yavne bechachameha." I know we're going to lose the temple. I know we're going to lose everything. Just let me have Jabna which was a city in the Galilee, a pious place of rabbis and her and her sages, her scholars. That's what we need. That's all we need to keep Judaism alive, to keep the fire of our faith alive. We can have our, our faith without a temple because God is everywhere. You know, I often hear Christians saying that, oh, that's when the, the you know, the... Uh, the, uh, all, you know, the, the curtain was torn and so forth. I'll tell you, this was the, without, without any Christology, without any ideas of Christianity, we don't need that. We can have God everywhere, and that was always the ideal of all the pious Jews, even certain other sects that existed in the time, like the Essenes. They didn't, they didn't worship the temple. They went out to the desert to get away from from the corruption of the of the city temple, they went out and and and, and to Qumran and places like that. There was a small group, and they weren't so normal. But this is what they did, and they had a certain point. They had a certain. They had a certain. They, they, you know, you didn't need to idolize a piece of land. You didn't need to idolize the temple. God is everywhere. And we can approach God everywhere, and that's the essence of the Hasidic teaching. Is that God is everywhere and everything and everyone, and we can we can approach God everywhere. Every person could be as holy as the high priest. Every day could be as holy as Yom Kippur. Every place could be holy, like the holy of the holies in the temple in Jerusalem. We, all of these ideas of holiness, our sages teach explicitly, are halachic. They're, they have legal uh, variations. It has nothing to do with with nationalism, with the government. It has to do with Eretz Yisrael, Mekudesh, as we call her Atzos, that the Holy Land, the land of Israel, is holier than all the other lands. Why? Because that's where you can take the the Shtei Alechem and the and the uh, you know and, and, and the Omer and and the Trumas and Maisrus, all of these laws that apply in the Holy Land. That's what. That's what makes the Holy Land holy. Does it set apart for a positive spiritual purpose? Meaning that it has certain in, within Jewish 
laws described in the Bible, certain things that can only be in the Holy Land. That's all it's for. That's all our sages say Moses didn't go, didn't desire to enter the Holy Land, the Promised Land, because he wanted to eat its fruits. He desired to enter the Promised Land in order for one thing, to do the mitzvahs. And if you're not going to do those mitzvahs, you're going to have to, oh, I can't, it's too hard to keep the sabbatical. I'm going to have to sell the land and do a hetem mechira. That's the stupidest thing I ever heard of. I mean, are you really trying, you, you're claiming this righteous smichas gulaseinu? You're claiming this is the first flowering or redemption, didn't you? Didn't you read the Chumash? Don't you know Pirchi Avos? That Shemitah Sa'aretz is a whole, that brings Golos? Don't you realize? And it says, Az Tirza, Az Shapsasa, then the land will rest from its Sabbaths because we have to be off the land so the land can rest because we didn't keep the sabbatical. <coughs> and then you're going to go and trample on God's courtyards and break the sabbatical year and give us another year in exile because you want to live in the Holy Land? Does that make? Does that even make any sense? I'm saying from a religious standpoint, are you, are you out of your mind? Just think, you learn Chumash, learn Mishnah. These are basics. We're not talking about that some obscure Yushalmi somewhere. We're talking Pirkei Avos that everyone, every, every Cheder Yingle learns. And then it says, Gol is what? Al Shemitah Saaretz. 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 Where does Shemitah, where does the sabbatical year come? against the three cardinal sins that we're supposed to give our life as martyrs for rather than, than violate. That shows how serious that is. That's not a game. And, and, and you claiming you want to bring Mashiach by going and settling the land, and you're pushing Mashiach off. That's simple. That's, that's simple Torah. Part. I don't know what you're thinking. And this type of attitude... Of, you know, oh, we're gonna conquer the land, we're gonna chase them all out, we're gonna do it. What are you talking about? They couldn't do that in the time of the judges. The, King Saul didn't even do that. King David wasn't even totally successful. What are you talking about? Even King Hezekiah knew he had to live peacefully. And he saved Jerusalem from being destroyed by the Assyrians because he because he because he, he was pragmatic and he was diplomatic. You gotta, you gotta be normal. You can't, you can't be an extremist. You know, you wanna, you wanna be an extremist. You wanna dress in a certain way. You wanna be strict in keeping the Sabbath, keeping kosher, keeping Passover, and, and, uh, and things like this. You wanna go there, make every day. Oh, that's beautiful. You're not hurting anybody. You're helping and making the world a nicer place. And if you do so with a smile and you're polite to all different people of all different faiths, and, and or even of none at all. And you, and you make a Kiddush Hashem, that's the most beautiful thing in the world. That's what it's all about. But you're going to go and insult people because they have a different religion? They don't know any better. That's what they were raised with. Who are you to tell them what to do? We don't have... Mashiach's not here yet. That's our whole point. That's our whole argument with them. They say Mashiach came already, and we say he didn't come. And, the, and then you act like Mashiach is here already. That's, that's, that's the opposite of common sense. That's the most ridiculous thing I ever heard. You want to argue against someone who claims Mashiach is here already, and claims they know who Mashiach is, claims they know who the Messiah is, by doing what? By acting like the Messiah is here already. And the thing is, when the Messiah comes, we're not going to need to act like that, because God is going to open the hearts of every human being. The Torah promises us that. It says in Deuteronomy that I'll take this, the, stone, the heart of stone out and give you a heart of flesh. Meaning, Maimonides says, and the Satmar Rebbe brings this very clearly, that's the only way we're going to know Mashiach is here. You could go and fake everything. You could go and gather the exiles. You can go and build a temple. God forbid. All these things which we're not allowed to do. You could go and do all of those things. And unfortunately they've done half of them. But we don't see a change in heart. We don't see how God's word is written on every person's heart. You know? We argue against these other people claiming the Shiach is here already. And 
And uh, you know, the biggest argument we can have is why, why, if Messiah is here already, why do you have to send on missionaries to teach the whole world? Isaiah says the whole world will know about God, that the knowledge of the Lord will fill the earth as the waters cover the seas. And uh, not, you know, we won't have to teach any about one about God because they will all know of Him from the least to the greatest of them. That's you know, when Mashiach comes, we're not going to have to send out missionaries to con to convince everyone the Mashiach is here. That's like saying we're going to have to send missionaries to convince people the sky is blue, because everyone's going to know on their own. <laughs> and until then, we're in exile, and we have absolutely no right to intrude on other people's faiths to force anything. We're trying, you know, we're trying just to live our lives and 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 not bother anybody. And if other people are interested. We're happy to share with them, but we're, we're, we don't, we're not seeking to impose. We're just seeking to spread love and to be a light unto the nations just by being who we are. And in that way, um, we, should, we can live in peace with everybody. And you're going to get much many more bees uh, many with honey than with vinegar. Or flies with honey and vinegar, or whatever you want to say. And that's it. Let's try to live in peace. So again, the point of our video is we're condemning the actions of these hooligans. It doesn't mean we agree with other religions, but we can live in peace with them. Especially they're going out of their way to be respectful. This is absolutely inappropriate. And absolutely disgusting. And absolutely again. And I've seen, I've even seen creators of people uh, get involved in this mindset that's not, it's not the Torah way. We're, if we're upset about these things, we can be upset on our own in our prayerful moments between us and God. And, and that's where we should express our disappointment with some, if we uh, perceive something to be defiling the Holy Land and things like that. That's could be between us and God. Or, or even, you know, among ourselves, we want to talk like that. Uh, just to remind ourselves to keep our own faith. That's, that's, that's okay, but, uh, you know, like I know, you know, the Tzadikim were upset by these type of things, but they didn't go and protest them, meaning, you know, there was uh, great Tzadikim, they were upset, you know, when the Pope visited Jerusalem and things like that, but they only expressed it among themselves, they didn't go and protest against the Pope visiting, against this, against that, because it's none of our business. We're in exile, and that's our that's that's the whole thing. It's uh, we can we can we live our lives and we let them live theirs, and that's it. And it's really <laughs> disgusting to to think otherwise. So again, I'm sorry I spoke so long, but I feel very strongly about this, and um, I hope and pray that we can live in peace with other people, even if we disagree. Because uh, everyone disagrees, you know, but we can live in peace, you know. I, I was listening to Glenn Beck, he said, you know, he can, you know, he's a libertarian. He can be best friends as Penn Jillette. He, Glenn Beck is a Mormon, very religious, and Penn Jillette is an atheist. And they can sit and be best friends. Why? Because not one is trying to use the government to impose their will on the other. They can live together peace and that's you know there are certain basic things I think that we all agree on you know that I think everyone would agree on but there but other than that all right there are people who don't agree because they, they, they do different things but you know I mean even you know it's very interesting how Glenn Beck he talks about this he says you know he has he's you know being more and more open to the libertarian ideas of ending the war on drugs and things like this, and here he is, the Mormon. Mormons don't smoke, they don't drink, they don't even, they don't even drink caffeine. It's against their religion. But he's not seeking to put his religion on other people. He's not going out and trying to get caffeine banned in America or alcohol or tobacco. And he's actually saying that marijuana should also probably be legal. And this is, this is a religious man. I heard Pat Robertson said the same thing. Very religious guy. Now, I myself have never tried that. I have no interest in it. Even if it's legal, I don't think I would try it. I have no interest in marijuana. It's not interesting to me. I don't know. I don't even understand it. It's not, it's not my thing. But to put people in jail 
and ruin their lives because this is what they do. They never hurt. If they were under the influence of a drug and they hurt someone, so they should be prosecuted for the damage that they did, not for using the drug. What they have to do with it? Uh, meaning they prosecuted for meaning if the drug caused it, alright, so then maybe you could criminalize that as well but but just someone is, they're in their own house, in their privacy of their own home, and a, an adult I don't, I don't I don't understand why it should be illegal we have to live and let live that's it um, so the same thing you know, we can be you know, and I'm, I'm and if any of the, the settlers who are, who are protesting this or, uh, you know, in <coughs> Mount Zion. And maybe you're hearing me, maybe you understand English. And maybe you're hearing me. Maybe go and apologize. Maybe be a man and go admit that you did something wrong. And apologize for being disrespectful on their holiday. How would you like it? You're in the middle of reading the Sarah Sedibris and Schwartz and they should come in and start cursing at you. <coughs> what, what's... What's wrong with you? What's, they're not they're not hurting you. They're being respectful. They went out of their way not to bring their icons and so forth. Not to even bring incense. Things that are, see, I would think would be central to their practice. And they're being respectful. Show some respect. All right. Well, thank you for watching. If you please uh, comment, like, share, and uh, and subscribe. And also, uh, you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. I'm sorry I spoke for so long. Uh, God bless you. God bless America. And let's hope, like, the Talmud ends with the following statement, that God could find no vessel that could hold blessing other than peace. As it says, the Lord gave strength to his people, the Lord blesses his people with peace, that peace is the conduit to which all blessing comes. Let's hope and pray for a time of peace, and that we can all live in peace and harmony, and and then we'll see that time when the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the seas, and we'll all live in peace and harmony, and uh, and, and, and we'll see an end to all this violent nonsense and, and, and really disgusting and anti-Torah and anti-common sense uh, nonsense that we see from some of these hooligans. I, I myself, when I was young, you know, I, I shared some of these ideas, although I never took it that far, you know. I always was respectful, but I, you know, I, I, I grew you know, felt some of these ideas, but you get older, and you get, and you become a man, and you realize, and I'm still not there, and I'm, st I still have a lot of foolishness in me, and, and a lot of rudeness, and a lot of things I have to work on, and I'm, in some ways, I'm speaking to myself, and giving muster to myself, but, you know what, let's try to work on these things together, let's try to live in peace together, and, uh, and again, I want to, if, if someone, perhaps, in the Greek Orthodox Church is watching, I want to, even though I, I wasn't really involved in this, uh, if, if, if it means anything, my apologies. I really want to give a sincere apology uh, to, the, to these folks who were just trying to, li to do, uh, live according to their religion. And uh, I, I hope and pray that we can live in peace and harmony together. God bless and thank you.